Welcome back from uh, the break. We talked already about the role of algorithms in social media uh, today in the in the panel on uh, on yeah on media and education. And yesterday we already um, had the discussion in the context of yeah of the the the, the roots for for a for a democratic uh, and peaceful society. And then we also had some side discussions about um, narratives um, around protests and um, around yeah, social media discussions and how they play a, play a role today. And now we have uh, a talk about peace building in the digital era, era with Andrew Suthayo and Dava Abdullah. And uh, I give you the floor for uh, the talk now. Um, it will be about 35 minutes, and uh, so that we can have 10-15 uh, minutes Q&A afterwards. Um, yeah, give a warm applause to the reference. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Davar Mohammed. Uh, I'm a journalist working for a local media organization called Kurdistan 24, based in Iraqi Kurdistan region. Uh, today, we will be presenting, uh, to me, it's a really interesting topic, uh, and also a very uh, new one. Uh, as I have uh, you know, jumped into this world uh, uh, almost very recently, and the reason that I really wanted to take part in this uh, was to really encourage people and also deliver and convey the significance uh, of peace building efforts digitally. It has been a topic uh, for a very long time, but as, as with the rapid growth of technology and digital media, uh, we are more in need of, of, of this uh, critical tool in our uh, lives. So today, uh, I'll be uh, talking about peace and conflict and digital era with my uh, colleague, Andrew, who will be presenting the technical part of a very important tool that will be helpful in, 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 in terms of achieving uh, the end goal, which is achieving uh, peace and building peace digital uh, world. Uh, I'll go, uh, I'll go uh, throughout my presentation, I'll talk about these, these two concepts, as well as uh, uh, my very recent participation in an interesting uh, uh, research project. Uh, uh, it was called DMAPS, uh, uh, organized uh, and uh, uh, presented by uh, Built Up, uh, which is a non-governmental organization uh, and funded by British Council. Uh, Mr. Andrew was one of the uh, amazing uh, member of the technical team who uh, developed, uh, uh, let's say, a tool system that really helped us as digital peace builders in terms of identifying all the issues and all as well as designing interventions uh, to resolve them. So I will be presenting my part and then Mr. Andrew will uh, walk you through all the technicalities of that tool that was really helpful. So firstly, peace and conflicts have been the almost the two most longstanding themes and, and uh, 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 marks in our lives in everyone uh, in everyone's societies around the world. Uh, it depends where you live. I get that. For example, I am from a region, the Middle East, uh, which is known and uh, which is known for its long-standing conflicts, whether it's religious, ethnic, sectarian. Uh, they have been there because it's a really, as we call it, uh, uh, a hot area uh, that, that uh, in terms of climate, as well as in terms of, you know, ongoing conflicts. Uh, sometimes they, they get really violent. 
and this is what really concerns people both inside the region and outside the region as they depend on the region for a lot of uh, its resources and and the connections and the, the, the geographic uh, similarity. So it's not new. That's my message. Peace and conflict are not are nothing new that we are discussing today. What What is new to us uh, or, or what has become uh, a new trend is talking and discussing these concepts in the digital world. We are very uh, invested in, 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 in technology and in its advancement. But unfortunately, little uh, uh, attention has been given to all these consequences that, that are the result from this, this technological uh, advancement. Peace and conflict are, uh, uh, you know, two two parts of, of this uh, 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 of this issue that have been given less attention. Uh, so, if we de- define peace, uh, I think anyone can have uh, a definition of its own. Uh, but uh, the the definition that I picked up, and I believe this that really fits uh, the concept of peace, is. It, it's not only about the absence of violence. It's not the it's 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 not enough for the, the 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 weapons to cease fire. It's more than that. It's a climate. It's an atmosphere in societies that people feel they they can thrive. They can develop themselves. They can grow. That's peace. It's it's uh, it's it's a kind of situation where you feel secure, where you can predict a foreseeable future and you feel you have the sense that that this is going to be the case for a long time uh, on the other hand we have conflict which is basically uh, it's a clash of opposing feelings or needs that's very simple we see that conflict in every aspect of our lives uh, as uh, we see later so uh, what is the difference that that that's that's going to be the next question? And I know that many of you might have it on your minds. Uh, what's the difference between this digital, uh, this peace building effort in real life and digitally? And that's an important question. And I think that's the main theme of of this talk that I'm giving right now. The there are similarities uh, for sure, but. The, the differences are uh, uh, the, the differences are the things that ma- that make this effort unique and requires our special attention. In real life, we see that diplomats, politicians, uh, researchers, university lecturers, uh, acad- and from the academic community generally, come together to discuss the issues that their society suffer from. And it's usually conflicts between the members of their society. And and we know the actors. We know who, who are the opposing sides, what, what are their needs, what are their frustrations and concerns. They come together to, to discuss those issues in detail and to find solutions. Unfortunately, sometimes they lead nowhere. They lead, the only thing they lead to is the continuation of conflicts. Uh, that uh, that turns into violence, and uh, it could be very deadly. Uh, but in in digital uh, era or world, peace building is 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 very uh, is, has become very challenging uh, because of two main reasons. There are other reasons definitely, but two main ones. I in my opinion, I think are obstacles. Uh, or challenge, uh, big challenges for the process are first rapid flow of information. Uh, given the uh, the technological advancement we have, and second is the multiplicity of actors. We can in real life we can have one opposing actor, for example, representing a community. Okay, it could be a political party, it could be an organization, it could be. Uh, you know, any sort of other entity. In the digital world, 
that person, let's say, or that entity could multiply due to the, the enormous uh, access that social media gives you to represent yourself or digital world in, in, in general terms uh, through websites, through, you know, at, our focus is more on, on social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and other uh, social media networks. Uh, it, it gives you an enormous, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to represent yourself through multiple channels, through uh, multiple tools that you can amplify your voices. So this, 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 this is also a blessing, but at the same time, a really big challenge when it comes to digital peace building, because you re uh, then you deal with with an enorm uh, uh, a, a significant. Uh, source of of of, uh, of people or entities that try to push uh, uh, f uh, uh, to push forward their causes as well as that, um, might use all that uh, that opportunity to attack the opposing uh, sides uh, and and what uh, we really uh, did in our uh, project with the build up uh, was was to to firstly analyze this this uh, this this um, let's say uh, uh, landscape, uh, who are the opposing sides? Uh, what they need? What are their frustrations, concerns? What is what are their narratives uh, that they use? And uh, I'll, I'll go into the uh, 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 more detail when it comes to to uh, the, uh, the 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 project I, I took part in. Uh, and, and there are also, uh, the, the, in addition to the challenges, we have you know, tools at uh, our disposal uh, that we can use in order to tackle those challenges. So that's the bright, that's the good news here. One of the tools uh, uh, that was also part of that project I really uh, benefited from uh, was network or actor mapping uh, in the digital uh, world. So who are the actors? Who are the opposing actors? What they want, you know, where they are located, and um, uh, what, what they say, what they write. Uh, and all this kind of information uh, is very, very crucial for understanding the conflict, for uh, analyzing it, for uh, even forecasting uh, its trends, as well as, most importantly, to design interventions. If you want to deal with this challenge, if you want to build peace digitally, you really need uh, this. 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 Uh, uh, this is also a tool, as well as uh, a necessity that that you need to have at your disposal in order to tackle this challenge of 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 this. Uh, uh, multiplicity of actors, which is on you know a huge magnitude, uh, you really need to analyze and group them together and see who are they and what they want. So, in in the uh, uh, the, the official term that says the network or actor mapping, that's that's one of them. The second one is I think part of any uh, day to day life of a digital peace builder. It's the ongoing social media monitoring. It is similar to the life of a journalist, uh, uh, you know, that I have, that you have to be constantly aware of the situations, developments, whether political, economic, uh, or any other sort of uh, developments that take place around you. You need to have that awareness to see what's going on, Sometimes it's not for the sake of your work. It is a habit. You, it's, it has become a, a, it will become like a habit for you uh, to follow all these developments. So later you feel that you can, uh, uh, that, that that will be useful for you in terms of, 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 of uh, being aware of all the uh, trends that are taking place. So for the digital, digital base builders, uh, similarly, this is also a case that they have to have that high awareness of what's going on in their societies. 
in terms of, uh, you know, who are the actors, the channels, the media organizations that have a big presence on social media. And they can affect people's perceptions on, on, on many aspects or whether they are um, a source of spreading hatred, fake news, misinformation, uh, hate speech, and all of that. That all comes from an ongoing social media monitoring. For example, uh, in our project uh, with uh, Build Up, uh, we, we had another tool uh, uh, that we used uh, during the research project was narrative analysis. Okay, you have monitored, you have the actor map, you have mapped out the, the, the actors, the entities that are opposing sides to each other. And you have the information, what they write about, uh, how they want to lead societies or people, and how they want to affect people's perceptions. But what is now here? That's, that's called narrative analysis. Then you come and analyze all their talks or their perceptions, what that means. But sometimes it could be indirect. Um, you, uh, you won't be lucky to find someone directly threatening another group or uh, a person or uh, uh, a religious a member of a religious group you can uh, sometimes you can't find um, direct uh, religious uh, you know hatred comments um, it, it could be uh, you know very indirect and subtle for example in this example that's uh, on the screen uh, this is a poster published by a, a very uh, famous uh, Iraqi television called al Shafia. Uh, which has a lot of followers uh, uh, and viewers, both on social media and, and on TV. In one post that's about COVID-19 infections, uh, they chose a picture of members of a particular sect in Iraq during the religious ceremony. And they wrote on it that Iraqi Ministry of Health wants of increasing COVID-19 infections. Nothing. There is nothing wrong with this statement, right? What is wrong is... The, the choice of the photo for that statement. And all the people here knows that this is, this, this photo is taken, or these, uh, you know, ladies are performing a religious ritual. And then, then, then the, the negative, uh, uh, let's say, perception that it gives very indirectly that uh, blaming this sort of religious uh, rituals and members of that uh, uh, that that group uh, to be a source of of of, of spreading COVID nineteen. However, these religious ceremonies were halted uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but this is this is the kind of danger uh, that that uh, that you will expose during your narrative analysis by analyzing it by understanding the motive behind. Uh, these kinds of state, uh, statements that are put out here. Uh, we have another issue in the digital uh, world that uh, for any digital peace builders, they, they have to tackle and they have to face it uh, generally, is the issue of hate speech, misinformation, and disinformation. My, my country, my region is not devoid of this. I know it's a, it's a global issue nowadays. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, societies and other uh, have uh, are lucky to have uh, uh, correct tools uh, at their disposal to tackle this issue. Uh, unfortunately, in our parts of the world, this is still a growing uh, awareness uh, 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 raising issue that we are dealing with. But what I can say that uh, hate speech and misinformation have always said that it, it's fatal. It, it, it can kill people. Uh, I've seen it, um, and this is also a case here, that people, groups have been discriminated, even killed, uh, based on misinformation, disinformation, and speech. Uh, and I believe it's an important uh, uh, aspect for any digital peace builder to deal with. Uh, of course, uh, challenging misinformation is one way, uh, you know, to, to tackle this issue. Uh, and that challenging could be through debunking misinformation, disinformation on, on particular uh, social media platforms. Uh, there are uh, a few organizations that do that in Iraq. Uh, hopefully they are growing um, and uh, it could be in the comment section sometimes. 
uh, that that you have a team or you as an individual, uh, you see a post, uh, you comment on it, you try to um, particularly or replying to uh, you know comments from other people, other commentators, to 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 raise that awareness. This is fake. Be careful, and you provide evidence for it. For example. So all, all sorts of uh, uh, these, these steps could be taken to tackle this. Or it could be one-on-one conversation. Sometimes in terms of in, in the subject of hate speech, um, uh, you know, some people targeting another group in the comment section as we dealt with. And, I, and this was my particular uh, focus. It, it was under my particular focus. Uh, how can I uh, 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 work to in order to... Uh, tackle the issue of hate speech against religious minorities in Iraq uh, in the comment sections of many posts that were about you know their um, their religious peace and ritual where people were uh, fanatics uh, were attacking them and shaming them and spreading misinformation disinformation one way we uh, I, my team and I uh, took was uh, was was to uh, try to speak to those uh, kind of people and telling them this is this is this is not true. People are not like that. But it, also that conversation is I compare it to a talk therapy. You really can't uh, force them to speak. You really can't just say no, you're wrong. No, it's not going to work like that. You need to speak to them peacefully in order to reveal their frustrations. It could be in the comment section. It could be in your private uh, direct messages or any other tool in order to let them tell you their frustration and then you, you you can challenge those thoughts through that or paranoia if they have any so as part of the digital media arts for an inclusive public sphere project dmaps uh i it was it was a huge and a significant steps towards uh digital business building because it equipped us as people from iraq and Kurdistan region with the necessary tools with the necessary uh, 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 process uh, that can that can help us in identifying as well as uh, designing interventions for this issue, uh, and in and as part of, of the program, uh, I, I was uh, with uh, uh, my colleague Andrew. Uh, we uh, uh, the technical team developed a system uh, uh, or process or tool in order to help us or uh, the base builders to to. Uh, to achieve our goal, which is identifying and analyzing and designing interventions, and also following up on the uh, on the interventions we make, uh, my colleague uh, Andrew will be uh, will walk you through all the technicalities of um, of the uh, of the talk, uh, and I will I'll come back later uh, to share my experience with that great system, uh, and uh, it's. Uh, it's time to present uh, Spark. Uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Perfect. <clears throat> Thanks, Navar. Um, so as he said, my name is Andrew Strayo. Uh, I'm a data scientist. I've been for seven years. Um, also the chair of Correlate Netherlands, which is an NGO which brings data science to other NGOs. Um, on top of that, I'm also a partner at a end -end machine learning um, consultancy uh, called Data Value People. And together with them, we um, helped build up uh, Create Phoenix, which is a um, technical platform to help local peace builders uh, respond to uh, social media. So uh, as the far said, we have these problem statements that come from local peace builders. Um, there's a multitude of things that they can do, interventions that they can do, um, but there are so many people and so many places where these interventions can um, be placed how do we make sure that the intervention that we're placing is uh, going to the right place and if it's the correct intervention at all? Um, for that, we need to munch through data. So um, the thing that I'm gonna be talking about is the data pipeline to get all that data in, um, how to get automatic labeling models uh, to reduce the manual organization of the data, and uh, how to get a dashboard to get this information to local peace builders. Uh, next slide, please. For the computer scientists among us, this can look uh, familiar. It's also quite a standard structure for a data pipeline. Um, we have data coming in for us at social media, 
Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, event data. Uh, we need to get it into our system, which we call raw. We need to organize it, anonymize it, do some inference on it so that it can provide value to Devar. To be able to do that, we also need some manual labeling. Um, and once everything is um, processed, it needs to be shown on the dashboard. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, data sources. Um, again, if you have a CS background, I'm sorry, this is going to be uh, quite shallow. But we have uh, APIs, uh, application uh, programmatic interfaces, ways for code to contact um, Twitter or YouTube um, so that we can get the data in. Uh, one thing to note is Facebook and Instagram used to come from the CrowdTangle API, which uh, Meta um, um, published. However, due to bad PR, they are discontinuing it, probably. Um, so right now we're applying for Facebook Graph API, which hopefully will get us the same thing. Um, that's where most of the data comes in. Um, some things we aren't able to get through APIs, which we'll need to manually scrape. In this case, Facebook comments. We created a small plugin where um, people like Devar can uh, look at a post and look at comments. And while they're scrolling through comments, we screen grab it and um, take the comments in to our system. Um, beyond that, we also have databases. Uh, in this case, the ACLED, which stands for the Armed Conflict Location and Event, event Data, which is a near real-time data of um, reported political violence and protest events, has locations, dates, actors, fatalities, and what type of conflict it is. Um, what we do is we get it all in. We don't change anything at all. No modifications. Save it as is, either in JSON or, for us, Parquet. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the organization. This is 80% of my work, um, but we'll run through it in one slide. Um, <laughs> so we organize things because we want to be able to compare and contrast uh, between different platforms. We also don't want to repeat pieces of code to process each platform separately. So what we do is we uh, map things that are similar between platforms into one structure. So uh, discourse, while tweets have a character limit of 280, I believe now, and uh, YouTube comments and Facebook posts don't, they're all snippets of text that people are using to speak on the internet. So we can map that into a bit of discourse uh, data. Um, same thing for authors. So whether it's a Facebook profile or a Twitter handle or a YouTube account, it's all a person or a thing that places this snippet of text online. Um, important is that we map only what we need. Um, everything else we keep, but we keep separate. And for this, you can think of uh, unofficial retweets in Twitter where you put an RT at the start, or certain reactions in Facebook, like haha or lol or whatever. There's no real easy way to map that to everything else. It might be interesting at a later point, um, but it doesn't map cleanly into. Cool. Uh, it doesn't map cleanly into um, uh, uh, one structure. Um, here, we save them as Parquet files. Um, if you want more tech uh, questions, ask me later. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, to me, is the fun part as a data scientist. Um, on my classification inference, so the overarching and fundamental aim for us is to build a model or a representation or theory of the system that we have an interest in. Uh, in this case, we're aiming to build a representation of the dynamics and drivers of conflict within societies from how they're played out in discourse in the digital public space. Then you can use that model or theory um, to ask it, firstly, what will happen with this system in the future or what's likely to happen with the system in the future? And secondly, what's likely to happen in the future if we were to take a certain action to affect the system. So in our case, we want to be able to ask something like, oh, please go back. <laughs> uh, we want to ask it, 
something like, um, how might we affect the system if we do initiative X? Now, these theories or representations of systems will be something um, between precise mathematical models um, and fully qualitative and f fuzzy theories. Um, now, to do that, um, we need to be able to view what's going on in the system at a level that's uh, higher than the micro level. Um, to create an analogy, um, if you want to understand what's happening in a forest, uh, you, don't own a, uh, you don't always consider every tree uh, as an individual. You try to categorize them into species um, and then try to look at aggregated data or more macro level me uh, metrics uh, and properties of the system. So for this forest, we can ask um, what proportion of the forest is oak tree. In the same way, uh, we want to be able to ask what proportion of the discourse uh, in the data sets that we've uh, crawled is about the economy or about gender or about sectarianism. Now, to answer that question of what proportion of the discourse is about gender, uh, we need to find a way to efficiently um, identify which of these discourse data points are about gender. So this is where uh, automatic classification tools and models come in. Um, we ask the peace builders to develop a taxonomy uh, that's specific to their research question. Ask them then to manually label a small uh, sample of the scraped data, um, and we then use that manual data set uh, to build a general classification model. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a bootstrapped Google Sheets, because uh, the first thing you do is you find whatever works. Um, this has tweets in the chronological order. Um, they can read the text and say, hey, is this about gender, uh, sectarianism, economy, um, or other, irrelevant. Uh, we also give them the option to say, all right, there are certain keywords in there which mean that if you see this in any text, it's always about sectarianism, uh, as well as, okay, there's a keyword here that usually means it's about sectarianism, but not always. Uh, next slide, please. Once we have this, um, this annotated data, uh, we can make rule-based and uh, statistical classification models for a number of different things, text relevance, subject topics, hate speech, types of conflict, and online behavior. Um, and we also ask them to make uh, actor and affiliation labels uh, from a pre-identified list. Um, with this, we can then run this on the rest of the data set that um, they haven't seen before, haven't annotated, to get classified labels for all the data. So with this, we can go a level deeper and ask not just how many, but how are oak trees distributed within the forest? Are they evenly spread out? Uh, are they in tight clusters? Uh, analogously, we can ask, okay, in what areas of the network are individuals um, uh, that are speaking about gender? Um, is that discussion localized to certain groups of accounts? Is it localized to certain people? Um, so the answers to this question um, help us build that representation uh, or theory of the system, and that allows us to uh, gain that insight into what an effective uh, initiative could be to affect that system for the better. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what's the value of this? Uh, in the overarching game, uh, it's to take all this fine-grained data, uh, build a high-level high representation of it, um, you could read every single post um, if you had infinite patience and infinite time, but we don't. So we need to be able to compress that data um, down into something that's consumable to humans. Uh, same way that if you uh, want to understand a forest, uh, you don't analyze every single leaf. Now, there are many open source models uh, out there that compress data into something that's consumable by us, and a lot of them are very good. Um, we use this to improve our own inferences. Uh, improve being the operative word here, um, as all open source models are trained for a use case that's slightly different than ours. Um, so an open source model might be very good at boiling down whether a particular discourse data point has a positive emotion or a negative emotion attached to it. Uh, what it won't be good at is understanding the localized context and building that representation that we want. Um, hate speech and the words that are used to display that hate speech 
uh, are different in different countries and regions. Uh, and it's something that I, as a data scientist or a programmer from the Netherlands, know nothing about. And it's something that um, I don't have enough knowledge for to create a representation for. What I can do is I can facilitate the flow of information um, into the system from people like Tavar, people that are part of that context, uh, people that are steeped in that conflict or are part of that community. Um, next slide. Actually, go, go two more because we don't have enough time for this. Um, yeah, so uh, let me take you through this dashboard in, uh, general, um, in a general case. Uh, what this dashboard allows you to do is to slice and dice based on uh, sentiment based on uh, peace builder defined classes such as sectarianism or religion um, and uh, look into date and cross reference with things such as the ACLED database. Uh, it's currently made on uh, AWS QuickSight, but we're moving towards Apache SuperSet because free and open source software. Um, but to showcase how it's used further, um, I'd like to hand over back to Devar. Great, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Andrew, uh, on the dashboard uh, that uh, we had and uh, we really uh, uh, took advantage of was, was in terms of targeting interventions, in terms of, for example, in one case, we wanted to find out uh, which media organizations based in Iraq across the whole country that have uh, posts, uh, even their own posts and the comment section that have a lot of negative sentiments. And we were able to identify them easily without going through all of these uh, uh, pages. And uh, the system gave us you know, the top five uh, uh, pages that, had, that attracted uh, during a certain period of time that you can choose a lot of negative sentiments. And then you can uh, narrow down later to see uh, against whom and what were the reactions, how were, uh, because we had different uh, uh, also uh, uh, sentiments uh, in the system. Uh, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the other uh, part of, 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 of the project was also about uh, uh, using the dashboard to design the intervention, as I did later when I made a, an awareness raising uh, video uh, and also an uh, uh, online campaign uh, that, that was wholly based on the results we got from the dashboard. So in conclusion, I want to say that uh, Digital base building is, if it's not uh, already the case, it's an integral part in, uh, of, of future conflict resolution methods. Uh, I think this is, this is the most important part of it, that we have to uh, sooner or later deal with it. So, and that's why as a local peace builder, I'm 100% uh, uh, for, uh, for encouraging this, this effort and, and improving it because that's, that's the future of conflict resolution. Thank you very much for your time. I hope it was useful. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, that we missed something in the presentation, we would like to get it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting insights in your work. And uh, it was amazing how you show how technology and humans interact and build together because often technology is understood as solving problems on its own but it always needs uh, yeah, intelligence how to build it and also how to use it and put it into practice. It was a very interesting example for it. To the audience, are there already questions to the talk? Otherwise, I, I, I'm, I would, would, would ask, there, is, there are many technical aspects, and, and, and one of them would be, um, it, you, you said that you, if you analyze the, disc, the discourse, uh, you, you normalize it. So um, then I would ask, is this a, a kind of finding uh, double posts and, and bots, for instance, or, or, or and, and to... to to bind it back to, to, to the real, real posters, or the, what would be the, the focus of normalizing um, the Twitter post, for instance? Um, 
It's it's less for that. I mean, we also do that, but that's a, a side effect for it. Um, the main reason for us to, to normalize things back is um, we want to build a data set of uh, this is um, an interesting corpus of data for us, so for a particular uh, research question. Um, as I said before, we have lots of open source um, models which work very well, um, but for us to get something that's useful for Devar or any other local peace builder, uh, we need to rebuild that, that corpus and uh, retrain the model to help understand um, differences between the data set that we're looking at and whatever the previous model was trained on. Um, not too sure if that answers your question. So it's mostly a data set gathering um, uh, effort. Yeah, my question was in the direction that um, some, yeah, you have the the danger of of a misrepresentation of discourses in in, in social media because if you have a a small amount of of people who are very well organized, um, then things can 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 look much more more. Um, Relevant than they might be in, in practice, and, and, and I, I wondered if, if, if this would be one one aspect of your your, your data um, normalization. In, in um, not really. I mean, it's it's always going to be inherently biased, also by the um, the way that we do our analysis. So um, we we don't have access to a Twitter firehose. Um, we ask them, okay, what what actors are important to you, what actors do you see, and from there we try to expand it to um, um, a small subset of the public online discourse. So we're always going to have that bias, but um, by picking and choosing actors that um, are important to the particular conflict, um, you're able to create this narrative analysis around a conflict that they've already specified. Um, so this, uh, sorry, I've, I've gone on a tangent. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's fine. I think it, it's getting, getting clearer now. Um, is there another question? I would just open the room for, for questions. I have a lot of, but yeah, um, there's one question from the audience. Hello. Yeah. Um, thank you for the interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, maybe you said it, but I, I missed it somehow. Uh, the, the categories, how many did you have? How many labels did you have? How many different ones and, and which ones? Um, so uh, there is a difference between labels and classes. So um, for classes, that depends on each of the, the groups that we um, that we serviced. So, Devar, I think you had about 10 uh, religion, sectarianism, something like that? Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, we had one about sectarianism. We had one about uh, religious hatred. Uh, I think these two about, th that was close to each other, but we, have eth we had ethnic uh, and others too. Yeah. So, uh, roughly between five and 10 per group that we helped. And then uh, labeled data, we had a couple of thousand tweets or posts that uh, we used to train a model. Maybe let me ask another question. Um, <clears throat> I, I still have, um, um, it, it's, it's not so easy to, to, to make up my mind how, how it really is in practice. There are two, two things. One, uh, how would you, in, in your local work, um, how would you see that, that the, the, the social media discourse is really so impacting your daily work? And in, 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 uh, uh, how strong is this interrelation? And the second one, um, uh, yeah, or maybe you want to ask um, to answer directly. Okay. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of uh, my uh, 
as a journalist, you mean, uh, and and how social media is affecting, uh, you know, my my profession. Uh, I, I deal with it every day. Uh, it's 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 part of my work, uh, you know, to debunk, uh, to to see the you know misinformation, to detect them, mis or disinformation, and also uh, it's uh, what we're really focusing on right now is uh, especially after the, the the research project I took part in. This is to to build an awareness about, for example, we have we report something on a religious uh, 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 fest uh, or ritual of a particular religious group inside our region. We try to, when we report it, we try to, in the background information. We try to provide uh, accurate information about the event, about the, the rituals, why they do it, and what's what, what's their significance for its people. Because this is the awareness we want to build through journalism to uh, to our audience. It, in my opinion, it was in the absence of this accurate information, and it's in the absence of it that uh, misinformation, disinformation grows, and people people take the chance uh, to target them. Mm-hmm. So, okay. so, 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 uh, the, the, to 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 wrap up my answer is is, is that. I think it's it's closely uh, interrelated, and 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 I, and I can't really do my work without uh, monitoring social media, all the trends, and trying my part. Uh, you know, con- uh, without trying uh, contributing to 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 to, to fix it. Uh, uh, you know, even if it's little, uh, I think uh, it's a uh, collaboration, an announced one, but uh, it's it's part of my work. Mm-hmm. And um, if there's no other questions from the audience, I would I would ask um, beyond your your work as a journalist, um, is there also a link to more to, to or how can I imagine the the link to civil organization groups? Um, do, are there is there interest in in monitoring media and interacting then in in, in real life operations interactions? Yeah, uh, uh, with regards to this question, uh, which is an interesting one, uh, in, in, in Iraq generally and in my region, Kurdistan region, uh, there is, I, I feel that there is a growing uh, appetite uh, for monitoring social media platforms because people are getting uh, aware of, of, of the dangers. Uh, we've we've, we've uh, already enjoyed the, the, the significant uh, significance of it, uh, the positive side of it. I think people are now waking up to see it could be really dangerous in terms of misinformation, in terms of disinformation, in terms of hate speech. And there are people, you know, uh, especially young people, are grouping up to, 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 to uh, some, some of them are just online initiatives, others are actual civil society organizations. One of them uh, who is also part of the research project with us uh, was Tech for Peace based in Baghdad, the capital of the country. Uh, they did an amazing job, and they are still doing it. In terms of, uh, uh, they are also monitoring our channel as well for for any misinformation or inaccurate. And they post it, and they uh, w- once they post it on on their platform, which has a lot of uh, 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 audience and followers. Uh, they uh, they try to aware people of, of fake news, of misinformation, inaccurate sometimes. So I believe it's a growing. We are in a growing stage. It's it's not fully and it's do it's not fully developed. But I, I understand this is because of lack of awareness, uh, which is now you know uh, uh, starting to 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 uh, uh, to garner momentum. Yeah. And to add to that. Um, the DMAPS project that we were a part of, it wasn't just myself and Devar and, and Build Up and Tech for Peace. Um, we had, I think, 19 or 20 local peace mil- uh, pe- peacemakers around the Middle East and North Africa, uh, Jordan, Libya, um, all jumping on this opportunity to understand the digital public sphere and figure out what kinds of interventions they can place on it. Okay, thank you. And maybe a, a last question. We as, as a fifth local group, for instance, how we could make use of your system? Um, it's free and open source software. So Great, because I, I, missed, I missed the GitHub link. Maybe I, oh, I'll It's just... a GitLab link. Um, I'll make sure it gets to you. Yeah, <laughs> fine. Good, thank you.
Um, yeah, thanks very much for the for the presentation. Maybe you give a warm applause to the to. Thank you. Both.